second conversation for this evening, we are going to be switching tracks from science and technology, but not for long. Uh, but I do hope to pick up at least one thread from the first conversation, which is of classical text. Our second speaker for this evening is an enviably prolific writer. Her work has appeared in over 50 periodicals, including uh, magazines such as Atlantic Monthly and The New Yorker, and been part of over 50 anthologies. She has uh, written several full-length books that have been translated into over 29 languages, and some of them have also been made into movies. She teaches creative writing at the University of Houston and is also an activist, particularly in the fields of literacy and women's uh, rights. It is no wonder that voices of women are front and center in her writing, including women such as Sita and Draupadi, who have existed in our collective consciousness for centuries, and yet they rarely speak for themselves. She was, uh, I think she was brought up in Calcutta. She was definitely born in Calcutta and moved to the US as a young woman to study. So the immigrant experience that is so deeply personal to her also finds its way into the themes of her writing. What I personally love about her writing is her imagination and her ability to recreate worlds that I otherwise would not have access to. Her recent book, her latest book rather, The Forest of Enchantments, is a retelling of sorts of the Ramayana through Sita's perspective. And I'm really looking forward to talking about Sita with her at a time when Ram has yet again overshadowed Sita in public and political debate. But before we do that, I'd also like to talk to her about Draupadi, who she's written about before. And I feel like her Draupadi is the perfect foil to her Sita. Please welcome Chitra Banerjee Devagaran. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So like I was saying, I am very eager to talk about your Sita. Uh, I uh, already feel a certain degree of affinity towards her. But before I do that, I'd like to touch upon Draupadi. And I would like to start with a very small, perhaps insignificant detail that stuck in my head nonetheless that Draupadi was required to be educated in 64 different arts, which perhaps was the norm at that point in time for a woman of her upbringing and her stature. And I'm curious about what some of these arts might have been, because I wonder how much the idea of an ideal woman has changed from many centuries ago to now. Thank you, that's a great question. Before I go into it, I just wanted to say I was really resonating with what Rohan was saying because one of my hopes in writing these books is really to bring the stories of our epics, the poetry in our epics alive and to make them really relevant for everybody but particularly for the lives of women today. So Absolutely. So, well, the 64 arts, you know, among them were things that you might expect such as um, cooking and uh, drawing and painting and all of those, but also beautification and how to how to uh, entice and charm men. Those were also parts of um, the 64 arts. Now, what Draupadi did not like is that the oh, is what the 64 arts did not include. They did not include the study of law or the study of statecraft or any of those other things that people thought were only for men. And Draupadi breaks those barriers and she studies those things. And they actually come in very useful at key moments in her life. Right. You know, you write about um, this, and, and, and I, I had read this book some time ago, so it's interesting what stuck in my head. And I purposely decided not to revisit the book again, um, just to kind of only talk about what's stuck in my head. And you write about this 
sort of risky but also beautiful little uh, side story about Draupadi's lust and attraction towards Karn and yet how she's almost forced to reject him. Where did you uh, draw your inspiration for writing that? Well, many of the side stories in both Palace of Illusions and Forest of Enchantments comes out of what I read in the original Ramayans, and I say it purposely plural, because there are many Ramayans and many Mahabharats. So they come out of little hints here and there, because as you know, in those stories, the women are kind of relegated to the edges of the story. So we don't get that much about what they're thinking anyway. So, but there are moments like when Karna comes for Draupadi's Swanger and he wants to participate in, uh, you know, that interesting, um, what shall I say, the test, right? And it's very possible that he will win that test. And um, that's, not, that's not okay. So uh, things happen and Draupadi says, I don't want you to participate. But as that happens, and in Palace of Illusions, I point to the fact that she's doing it to protect her brother, because otherwise her brother and Karan, who is a much better uh, a warrior, might get into a duel. So she's doing it for a motive that's not given to us in the general Mahabharat story. But she's really interested in him, because as far as she knows, at that moment, there are no Pandavas left anymore. They've been killed, right? So he is the greatest warrior. So from that, little seed, I started imagining other things that come up, certainly at moments in the Mahabharata, certainly when Karan is thinking, or Karan is speaking about her. And I've, uh, I remember reading that and wondering how different and perhaps even better her life might have been if she hadn't made that choice on that fateful evening, but um, we don't have a counterfactual, do we? So before we move on to slightly more serious questions, uh, perhaps another small, risky question, the Pandavas in bed, <laughs> right? Um, starting with Yudhishthir, how did you imagine their sexual personas? And as far as I remember, there's a point at which Draupadi calls Yudhishthir ladylike in, in bed. I wonder what she meant and what her year of educating him in sex uh, looked like. Right, and uh, you know, probably everyone knows this story, but when we think about Draupadi, at least in popular, uh, tellings or popular mentions of Draupadi, they're like, ooh, she has five husbands, isn't that something? And of course, I mean, men have been having hundreds at that time, hundreds of wives, but okay, we won't go there. Um, and everyone's like, wow, isn't that wonderful that she has five husbands? But really, if you think about it, it was quite difficult for Draupadi to go from man to man to man. That's not what she wanted. She didn't want to be passed around like that. And there's a whole other story behind why that happens. Maybe we'll go into it, maybe we won't. But the result is she is wife to one, each one of the brothers, one year at a time. At the end of which, so Vyas comes and gives her, gives this boon. And he says, after this, uh, you will forget everything that happened and you will become a virgin again. Um, only the second part actually happens. And she's very upset because, you know, she has to live with the memory of all these things, which is she doesn't want. But anyway, Yudhishthira is very proper. So she realizes that actually, thank goodness, she had those 64 arts because now she can actually use some of them to educate Yudhishthira. I wonder how that went. Um, but, you know, moving on perhaps uh, to a slightly more problematic actually very much more problematic aspect of this story. It is uh, one of those difficult episodes to uh, you know, reckon with in the Mahabharata, of course, and, and not because uh, Draupadi had five husbands or she was having sex with five men, but because of the lack of agency in her being able to decide for herself what her future would look like. I mean, she married Arjun who won the contest. Okay, I'm just going to stop here for a second. Is everyone in the audience familiar with the story that we're talking about, this particular episode of the Mahabharata? Everyone, yes? Anyone who is not familiar with the story? 
Fantastic. Okay. So I'm not going to waste any time recounting it, but for all she knows, she's marrying Arjun and she's going home uh, with him and um, her mother-in-law makes this decision that she has to be with all five men and Maharishi Vyas works out this arrangement about how it's going to work and the boys don't object and she simply has to comply. And this is a sort of classic template for how a lot of a rather barbaric patriarchal practices came to be and some of which persist to even uh, modern day and uh, off the top of my head I'm thinking of a rivaz called uh, Dhoti Chona which exists in parts of North India where a migrant laborer's wife can be impregnated by one of her husband's relatives because he's not there to sort of do the task. Um, but you know, even wider questions of agency are being debated at this point in time when it comes to women in India. We're debating triple talaq, we're debating marital rape. In the US, uh, reproductive rights are again being debated. At a time like this, how did you reckon with this episode? And how did your Draupadi reckon with it? Well, you know, in my interpretation of the Mahabharat, what I wanted to do is to show how Draupadi is really a very strong character. She's also very intelligent. And she does something which I'm hoping will inspire women now as well, which is she takes the situation she's been given, which is far from being perfect, but she uses it to her advantage. She knows how to take that, and she knows how to use her inner strength and her intelligence to turn it around. I think a lot of times that is the kind of uh, power that women can have, that they take something that's clearly not in their favor, but they maneuver around it. So although this is what happens to Draupadi, very soon, and this is even in the original Mahabharata of Vyas, she is the power in the house. She is the one that all five of those husbands listen to. She is the one who actually makes a lot of decisions for them. And she is the one who will finally make that decision about what, whether the war will be fought or not, to a certain extent. And yet, it's interesting, um, I mean, full uh, props to her for reclaiming that power in those very difficult circumstances. Yet, yet it's, it's interesting to me that when people talk about, I mean, she gets so much flack, right? I mean, she's seen as the architect of the war after everything that happened to her. And this is also kind of so typical in the way that women, when they try to appropriate power, that is not just handed to them. They're seen as manipulative, they're seen as wicked, and that continues to uh, the current day. And it reminds me of something that Isma Chiptai said in her autobiography that I was telling you about earlier, that you know, women, uh, I keep hearing this, that women use manipulation, men, women use wiles. What, well, what else do they have? What are they going to use? I mean, either they just give in to a patriarchal system that they are uh, living in, or they find ways to manipulate it. Um, it's interesting that you come back to this sort of theme of reclaiming power when you write about Sita, uh, and hopefully we'll get to talk about that. But before we do that, one more problematic episode, uh, which perhaps has fewer grays in it, which is the Jeet Haran. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, plain and simple sexual assault, right? Right, it's one of our earliest Me Too moments. Absolutely, in our and literature. and it's it's more problematic than that. I mean, I'm, I'm well, it's not an Olympic of 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 a uh, 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 sort of uh, oppression when it comes to women, but uh, it's also so typical in the sense that a woman's body is being used in a war between, as is being weaponized in a war between two groups of men that violence is being, sexual violence is being, and assault and humiliation is being used to arrest the power of a woman because Duryodhana talks about how arrogant she is before he orders her Vastraharan. Um, how did you deal with this episode? And how did, again, how did your Draupadi cope with this episode? Well, this is, uh, there's a couple of things that happened, and this was a very challenging scene to 
write the scene of the Vastraharan because it's so painful as I was writing it. I could really feel Draupadi's pain. And part of the pain is she has been so honored. She has been in such a powerful place and it's a complete um, 180 turnaround, right? And the way my Draupadi deals with it, which is a little different perhaps from how uh, Vyas deals with it because um, I have centralized Draupadi in Palace of Illusions and I'm really interested in her mental makeup and what's going on inside of her head. So I haven't changed very much of the externals, but as she's going through this very difficult episode and she calls on her own spirituality in the form of Krishna, that she's really reaching deep inside, she hears an answer and the answer says that if you don't let other people make you feel ashamed, you know, no one can really make you feel ashamed. That power is in you. You can't always control what happens to you. We can't, you know, as human beings and certainly as women. We don't always control those things. But how we feel about the act, if we're going to accept the blame or if we're going to accept the victimization, that part depends upon ourselves. And so Draupadi realizes that they are the ones who should be ashamed, not her. Even if they take off all her clothes, which doesn't happen, she doesn't need to feel ashamed. The shameful act is being done by the others. So she gains a great deal of strength in the middle of this difficult moment, which I really wanted to point out because that's her real victory. She goes on to do other things, but that's the moment of her real victory when she realized no one can shame a woman unless she allows it. And in a sense, the, the reams and reams of uh, sari, absolutely, that deserves a loss. And in a sense, that reams and reams of sari uh, become a metaphor of sorts, isn't it, for the endless, invincible reservoir of dignity that she reaches into within herself. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Uh, and that's, we that's have wonderful. that. We have that magic within ourselves. Absolutely. And that's, that's wonderful. And as we segue into... Um, talking about uh, from from property as we move to Sita, I'm going to ask uh, uh, one or two questions that I feel are common uh, to uh, both Palace of Illusions and uh, Forest of Enchantments, which is the difficulties as a writer for you to look at these women characters that have been created centuries ago through the prism of gender politics as it exists today. Is it really possible to reconcile feminism or the particular wave of feminism that we're in, in, in the moment, with tradition? Well, one of the things I discovered as I researched more and more into the Ramayana and the Mahabharat is that A, there are many versions, especially particularly of the Ramayana. So, our first mistake in, in our popular reimagining is to think that there is only one Ramayana, and that's the story. And really, the way we interpret the characters of Draupadi, but much more so of Sita, is through popular retellings. Uh, not the written retellings, but maybe movies, or maybe, you know, Amar Chitrakatha, or other things. The popular retellings, which often really don't take into account what Vyas is saying. Now, Vyas and, and uh, Valmiki, they have um, focused on the men, but they've left a lot of gray space around the women, which can be interpreted in a number of ways. And the popular interpretation of Sita, which often pained me and I took exception to, is that she's very meek, she's very mild, she's a victim, she puts up with what happens to her, she is passive and just allows you know, people to carry her away, et cetera, et cetera, or to save her. And it really doesn't account for the very strong character that I found Sita to be when I did research and thinking on her. So my project is to just, I want people to think about who these women really are. And especially with Sita, because unlike uh, Draupadi, uh, as I was growing up at least, uh, elders were always telling me, be like Sita, may you be like Sita. Sometimes they said it in a tone of despair, like she's never going to be like Sita. Yeah. But what they meant is that be meek and mild and don't make waves. But Sita's not like that. Okay, Right from the beginning, 
she's going to make a lot of waves. And there's a lot of strength in her, which are only in little moments in like the original uh, texts that were written by men. Absolutely, and there's a wonderful essay, I digress, but there's a wonderful essay that you should look up called 300 Ramayans, uh, which will give you a little bit more insight into what Chitra was saying earlier, but this is what I absolutely love about your Sita, right? But I have to ask, I mean, Sita as Draupadi is a, a, a mere mortal in the way she's remembered, a fallen woman even. Nobody names their daughter, or at least not, not enough people name their daughters Draupadi, but uh, millions of people must have named their daughters Sita. Sita is a goddess. Unlike Radha, she did not cross uh, boundaries and propriety for her desire. Unlike Kaikai and, and Kunti, she wasn't manipulative. Unlike Draupadi, she didn't question the system enough. I mean, at, at least that's how we, we think of her, as, as, as uh, this paragon of virtue as defined by uh, patriarchal sort of norms, right? Were you wary at all of wading into this? Well, I felt very empowered by her original story because I felt that in those silent moments, this in between all the things that men were doing, uh, she was being a, really a very strong and intelligent woman. Uh, for example, some of the things that she does, it's all in the interpretation. In a lot of, uh, let's say, popular paintings about Ram and Sita going into the forest, she's kind of, you know, very um, docilely following Ram. But actually, if you look at the scene, in, even in Valmiki, uh, Ram says, I'm going to the forest, I'm going to uh, take care of my father's vow. Now you stay over here and take care of the in-laws as you're supposed to be doing. And Sita says, no way. She says, I'm going to the forest with you. You're going to go and have all these adventures. My place is right there by your side. I'm going to go and you know, someone else will have to deal with the home. Uh, so that is a very modern decision. I'm right there with you. I'm going out into the world. The world is for me as much as the home might be for me. So I think it's all in the interpretation. And my Sita is the kind that will speak up and she will do things. Now, I, I haven't changed any of um, what actually happens in the Ramayana, but I'm showing it, I hope, through a different lens that shows where are those actions coming from and what are those actions really. If you look at the abduction uh, by Ravan, Often Sita is portrayed as someone who's just a victim of that. But I have shown how she really isn't, that when she goes to Lanka, in spite of being alone in a whole city that is hostile to her, she's able to maintain her dignity and she's able to look after herself. Bad things do not happen to her. And that's because, again, like Draupadi, inside she is so strong that Ravan is forced to respect that. You know, absolutely, this reminds me of uh, the fact that I'm, I'm uh, ancestrally, I'm from Ayodhya, and there's a very popular uh, folk song. Incidentally, uh, the ideas of Ram and Sita as they, you know, sort of uh, persist in the rest of the country are very different from how uh, people who grew up, you know, my families like myself who grew up in Abad see Ram and, and Sita. And, um, one of the popular folk songs goes, uh, where this is Kaushalya talking to Sita saying how, you know, you're the queen, you cannot possibly go into the forest. And she says, Ham avad narahibu, which is uh, uh, her, and it's, it's a song that says that there is no way I am staying in avad. I mean, I am definitely going. It doesn't matter what happens to me. And there's a lot of, um, she's extremely indignant in that song and she's even angry in that song and she's telling her mother-in-law that you must be crazy I and mean, the tone of the song is that you know, you must be crazy if you think i'm going to stay in a city which treated my husband in this manner i have my own dignity and i'm not going to just stay behind because i am afraid that the forest might be too uncomfortable it's a wonderful little song but um you know that that was a uh, small side digression, but what I wanted to, just to play devil's advocate for a second, a lot of people might view Sita, continue to view Sita as not just a victim of patriarchy, but also a perpetrator of patriarchy. And I say this because, um, you know, a lot of people see her conforming to standards of uh, virtue and, and uh, purity and duty that were then imposed on women for centuries to come. But you celebrate 
the quiet courage. You find it, not just, and then you celebrate it, that Sita had. And I was really moved by that because uh, in my line of work, I end up traveling a lot in, um, into Indian villages and I meet women who outwardly look like Sita's, who look like women who confirm to patriarchal ideas and, and mores, but um, they are picking battles every single day. They are fighting battles. And once you get to know them, they are no less feminist than I am. Uh, they just may not use that term to describe themselves. Do you sometimes feel that we define feminism, we end up perhaps inadvertently defining and understanding feminism in a very limited, narrow way? I think you are right in that we do. And in some ways, our notion of feminism is more urban, maybe more closer to Western. And I completely agree with you that here, right here in India, right now, in little corners here and there are women being very strong in a whole other way, a, a really Indian feminist way. And so I, I feel Draupadi and Sita are the two different faces of feminism. And Sita is like, you know what? I don't have to break all the boundaries to be my own strong self and ultimately live on my own terms and live according to my values. And in that way, she is really, I think, a whole other kind of, I don't know, inspiring force. So that... Absolutely. I, and you also... If I could just say... Of course, I, please, please. And uh, one of the... But her story has been forgotten or it's been like changed through time. So that when people talk about, let's say, the Agni Pariksha, a lot of people think that Ram is the one who says, go into the fire and prove that you are pure. And Sita meekly says, okay, I will go into the fire because yes, I am pure. No, Ram says at that point, I have done my duty. I have rescued you from Ravan. Now I cannot take you back to Ayodhya because you are considered impure. So you decide, you know, you can live with Sugriv, you can live with Vibhishan, but I can't take you back to Ayodhya because as king of Ayodhya, I just can't do that. And she says, she says to Lakshman, she says, build a fire. And my Sita actually picks up the wood and she builds her own fire. This is in Valmiki. She says, if, and Valmiki doesn't say what she says or what she's thinking, but my Sita says, maybe I can't live life on my terms because you have made certain decisions, right? Maybe I can't do the external things that I want to do, like go back to Ayodhya. But I will definitely live and die on my own terms. If, if I can't go with you, you can't tell me what I'm going to do next. And she lights a fire and she steps into it. That is an act of great agency. It is the greatest agency that she could have at that moment. And she makes use of it. And it turns things around. You know, it's interesting to me that Sita has always been idealized, and in a sense, you idealize her too, but in such a different way. Your Sita came across to me as somebody who has a very strong sense of right and wrong, except that she doesn't hate the wrongdoer. She just recognizes the wrong. And I think that comes across most strongly in the last part of the book. And I found it extremely moving. I read it a couple of times and I really wish that we had a copy of the book. I would have asked you to uh, perhaps read from it, but it's outside, you can buy it and read it for yourselves. Um, and in the end, what she does is, she rejects Ram in a way when she's asked for a second Agni Pariksha. She not just rejects Ram, she also questions his idealization as Mariada Purushottam, which I personally found very interesting because it's a question I have asked myself a lot of times. You know, the idea of Ram Rajya has been firing up the nationalistic imagination of this country, um, not just when it comes to the current dispensation, for, but for years on end. I mean, it's, it, it even predates Gandhi's idea of Ram Rajya in, in, in many ways. I mean, Shivaji. Uh, but I have often wondered whether the idea of Ram Raja is equally ideal for women. And she puts that question in a way to Ram. 
right, towards yeah. the end, your Sita. But she also forgives him. She does. And yes, she does. And I think, you know, in that that's where she is different from Draupadi. And that's where I feel she is an, an old soul. She's very mature. She's going to do what she needs to do. But she doesn't have to destroy other people to do it. She doesn't even have to, you know, she doesn't have to get... She is angry. She goes through all of that, right? When she first finds out, you know, Lakshman's taken her to the forest. She thinks that she's going to visit Valmiki for like a week. He says, no, you can't come back. Here she is heavily pregnant and told that her husband is banishing her for, you know, just because people have been talking. And she says, she gets very upset and she asks that question. She says, he's rejecting me because he thinks, or people have been saying, uh, these things might have happened, but she knows that did not happen. He's already seen the Agni Pariksha. So, and she says, who is going to judge him? Okay, people have been judging me, but who is going to judge him? Go back and ask that question. And it's an unanswered question. Like I think in many books that I have loved, there are unanswered questions. And my hope is that those questions go deep into the reader's psyche and the reader asks those questions. Now I hope that I have managed to make my portrayal of Ram a nuanced one. It's not like Sita good, Ram bad. That would just destroy the depth of this text. But he, he uh, privileges, let's say, the public role of kingship over the private role of being a husband and a lover and a father because he's sending these babies into the wilderness. And what Sita says in that moment, after she's been upset, she walks into the forest and she talks to the unborn babies and she says, I will bring you up. I'll be mother and father to you. I'll teach you everything you need to know as princes, but I'll also teach you how to be a good man and not do what your father has done to me. And I think that is how she responds. And she's a quintessential uh, single mother, uh, you know, and she chooses to be one, in fact, in, 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 in many ways, and does a fantastic job, like many single mothers continue to do. But just to your point of good and bad, no, absolutely not. I've read the books, and I think you do a wonderful job of carrying uh, through the moral ambiguity that these uh, very complex works embody in themselves. And um, I don't think that there is there is a very, you know, that, that your characters come across as, as, as black and white. And that's, that's one of the many great things about uh, the books that you write. Uh, but, you know, we talked about, we have very little time, we talked about uh, the cultural context and the historical specificity and uh, problems around that when we reinterpret characters uh, created centuries ago. But I also wanted to touch upon intersectionality. So both Draupadi and Sita are um, rich, they come from sort of privileged backgrounds, they are higher caste women, and in a sense, you and me are also relatively privileged women, Savarna women, discussing them, uh, sitting here and discussing them. And I was wondering how you deal with issues of intersectionality as an author. I was rereading recently Mahashwada Devi's Draupadi and wondering what these epics mean or can potentially mean in the lives of women who are not just oppressed because of their gender, but also oppressed because of their caste and their economic status? Well, my hope is that, you know, I, my hope is that the culture permeates, right? And that is one of the wonderful things about India, that these women who are in far-flung corners, they may not have the education, they may not have the financial, uh, backbone to support them, but the stories are there for them. And if we start retelling the stories the way I think they should be retold with the women at their center, doing difficult things under difficult circumstances, maybe fallen from great heights into situations not so different from what these women in really difficult situations are facing, Right? It takes Sita again as an example. One moment she's the queen, the next moment she's in the forest by herself with really 
nothing to support her except her own strength. My hope is the old stories live on and they have a lot of power as someone who loves reading and listening to stories as well as someone who's really dedicated her life to retelling or creating stories with women at the center. This is my great belief that through stories, we grow, we change. Stories have power. Amen. I think that's, um, well, that's a good moment. Uh, well, it's never a good moment for that to go because I had a lot more questions to ask you, but perhaps on another stage at another point in time. Thank you so much, Chitra. This was wonderful. It was wonderful having you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.